My name is Christina Panton. I'm uh, pleased to be guest moderating this panel. I am a recovering financial journalist with Reuters many, many years, and I'm currently doing corporate communications and in the Web3 world, uh, which is an interesting combination uh, given that the story of Web3 is still to being written as we speak. So it's a little bit different from the other kinds of PR and communications work that I've done in other places. But I'm very glad to be here in Hong Kong uh, with this group. All right, I'd like to welcome our speakers. And um, you've seen the promo before it, but I will just list them off. We've got Alessio from Hex Trust. Um, we've got Sebastian from The Sandbox. We've got Adrian from C, Inna from Code Green, and Karan from Barat Box. And I'd like to maybe ask a couple of our speakers where they're calling from, because this is this is the kind of work that we do. It's very dispersed. We're not all in the same location physically. Um, so just kind of curious. Um, and let me start with Alessio. Connecting from the same location from Hong Kong. Thanks. Welcome, welcome. And Adrian, Thanks. I think you're also in Hong Kong, are you? I'm here. Hong Kong as well, yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, um, is Karen here with us? Yeah, Karen's here. Hi, guys. I'm connecting from Bombay in India. All right. Pleasure here. to be here. House. Yes, <laughs> love, love to have you here. And Inna, are you with us? Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm connecting from Lisbon. Oh, wow. Okay, we've got the territory quite well covered here. Sebastian, where are you? Where in the world are you? Hello, everyone. From France. Okay. Great. We're, we're, we're quite well dispersed here. It's, it's quite nice. Good. Okay. So let's go on. We'll go ahead on this one. I just want to make sure that we, we, we give everyone enough time to, to talk about this very, very big topic. And um, we've got five people on this panel. It's a hefty panel. It's everyone's from a very diverse background, a different one. So we wanted to make sure that we covered different kinds of experiences and perspectives. So that's why we, we, we chose people who, who are not all from the same area. And we'd just like to start, maybe go around the five of you um, to talk about who, uh, what your role is, you know, what you do, uh, what your business line is. Uh, give a little bit of an intro. Um, and let's start with Sebastian. Of course, I have the honor to, to, to inaugurate. So my name is Sebastian Roger. I'm the CEO and co-founder of The Sandbox, as well as the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance. Uh, the Sandbox, it's a uh, decentralized virtual world where anyone can make uh, all, all sorts of like 3D content and, and uh, e social and immersive experiences without any prior knowledge, publish them on their land, truly own uh, their creation and monetize them the way they want. Uh, we've been uh, growing it as one of the leading decentralized uh, open metaverse platform, counting over uh, 400 major brands and partners in all regions of the world. Um, we also have a fantastic ecosystem of over 200 studios and agencies building on the platform and an amazing community as well um, that's uh, also over 25,000 landowners who are now able to self-publish on the platform and already uh, seeing hundreds plus experience live on the map for people to explore and play. Fabulous. Thank you, Sebastian. Could we go next to Alessio? Sure, thanks. Um, this is Alessio, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hextrust. Um, Hextrust is a uh, leading digital asset custodian, which basically means that we help uh, institutional investors to safeguard and utilize their assets uh, for different blockchain uh, applications. Uh, we currently have more than 250 institutional investors on our platform. Uh, we were born in Hong Kong around five years ago. We have also offices across uh, six jurisdictions, Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, uh, the UAE, um, in Europe, in Italy and France, and in the Bahamas. And we, our team is more or less 160 plus people. And we're very excited to have this discussion with our partners from especially uh, Sandbox uh, since we, we've been uh, partnering up with them um, since earlier this year. Fabulous. And, and thanks for hosting this, um, Alessio. And could I please, I remind the speakers, please to mute if you're not speaking, because this way we can cut down a little bit on the background distractions. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's move on next to Adrian to talk about you and what PwC is doing. Sure. Thank you so much. So I had um, PwC's crypto industry group in Hong Kong. 
Uh, here in Hong Kong, we have 100 people who are focused on crypto initiatives throughout uh, several lines of services. And so we help both crypto natives and the legacy players like banks, for example, uh, on crypto projects. So when it's crypto natives, it's really about uh, uh, getting more stuff. And when it's uh, the legacy players, uh, the other way around, we're trying to help them enter crypto, enter metaverse, enter uh, digital assets generally. So uh, that's my, my role uh, there is to uh, make this uh, happen and grow our uh, our presence in the field. And we uh, we'd love to we love to work with uh, Sandbox with uh, whom we've uh, we've, we've built uh, we bought land back uh, land on the Sandbox back in 2021. Um, so that was really uh, uh, a while back now. And uh, and so we uh, we're super happy with this this experience. Yep. Thank you. Great. Lovely to hear that, Adrian. Ina, you've got an interesting background, so tell us what's going on there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. So I am an artist and uh, UN Goodwill Ambassador. I've been an activist for the past 17 years around social, gender and climate justice. So the work that we do at Code Green, which I'm the CEO of, is we support uh, theme social, gender and climate justice. And we work with different entities to bring um, this in the foundation of the Web3 that we're building. So we we have different uh, ways of doing that. We created recently a game in the sandbox called the Hilvers that uh, empowers people to learn more about uh, climate issues and how they can take action and uh, and also educate them through the game while they're playing and enjoying themselves. And we also um, do fundraising through, uh, you know, um, auctions and we work with different entities. So the idea is really to create something that is strong in the culture uh, that we're building on the blockchain and that has link to uh, the real world. So everything that we do has an impact. So we're a mission and impact driven organization. And we've been uh, operating for the past uh, two years and a half. And, uh, but my, myself and the two other co-founders have uh, on a project called the Great Green Wall, which we've been working on for uh, the past uh, almost eight years now, which aims to regreen um, 8,000 kilometers from Senegal to Djibouti, so all across the width of Africa. And our newest mission is around women and land, how we can empower uh, ownership of land for women in, in, in the real world. But also, because we are a web organization, we focus on that uh, as well on the blockchain. Amazing. I'm, also, I'm a founding member of Web3 Women in Hong Kong, so you really align with what you do. And talk about going out of the box, so to speak, you know, with, with a heel game. I think it's called Heal to Earn, which is, to me, was a very new concept. But we'll, we can dive into that further. I, just, I think it's just fascinating enough. Thank you. Um, to round us out, Karan, could you just tell us about yourself and what you're doing? Thanks, Christina. Um, I'm the CEO of Bharat Box. Bharat Box is a JV company between Brink and Sandbox. Sandbox is SPV for India. Our goal is to bring Indian culture and brands onto the Sandbox Open Metaverse. Uh, we just launched in the first week of July. Uh, with Sandbox opening its office in India in the city of Bombay in the heart of entertainment, Bollywood and music. Um, and we're looking to uh, empower creators so they can build experiences based on two digital ownership and getting Indian partners and brands onto the Sandbox. You know, over the last 45 days, we've already onboarded more than 15 partners um, who, have, who are now collaborating with the Sandbox to build experiences. So excited, uh, excited for the next few months ahead as we continue to build in India. So I hear that it's called the Desi Metaverse. Is that right, Karan? Yeah, it's called the Bharatverse. So Bharat, which is Bharat Box. Uh, mm-hmm. The way we call it the company Bharat Box is Bharat is uh, the country India in, in, yep. in Hindi, which is an Indian language. Uh, box obviously comes from Sandbox. So we'll have the Bharatverse on, on, on the Sandbox. Yeah. Powerful combination, I have to say. So now it sounds like Sandbox is the glue holding everyone here on this panel together. Uh, it's a commonality, right? The common link. So I'm going to turn it over to Sebastian. Uh, because we never assume that everyone knows exactly what the metaverse is. To some people, it's still a huge mystery. Uh, but if Sebastian maybe could take us through on what the sandbox is, metaverse is and is not, and you know the role it's playing to to sort of bring these brands and these different projects together. Yeah, you're right. Like I really feel like um, with a close ecosystem, it, it, and it's fantastic to be on like such a conversation because then you can see like the wide range of uh, content that is being represented on the sandbox and on lands in general. Like you have 
on one side is a uh, joint venture with Brick, which is Barat Box, which represents like and brings like Indian culture in the form of like movie, music, sport, uh, architecture, tourism, and other local projects to onboard them into the metaverse. On the other side, you have with Hillverse and Cochrane a fantastic example of like how the metaverse can be used for like social good, positive impact, education, uh, inclusivity, empowerment. So, which are also a strong topic that we care about. And that leads to like the way we see the metaverse is like this myriad of virtual worlds where like anyone can access with an avatar that 3D character that become that their digital identity and use it to uh, explore uh, more social more immersive um, places and experiences that like can touch all those different topics and thematics they are not just games they are really social experiences that could cater to our education around music uh, around entertainment but all the more serious topics and what makes the metaverse different from like just a virtual world is like you can take your avatar, you can take all your digital items, belongings, creation uh, from one world to another, and they truly belong to you. So you can decide to use them in other worlds, you can uh, exchange them with other users, you can sell them. They give birth to a whole digital economy, new jobs, and new. Uh, opportunities, economic opportunities for people because the value is not locked or concentrated only within one platform that tries to capture it all, but a, a more early was all the actors of the chains uh, yeah. here, like the platform, the creators, the users. Yeah, speaking of opportunities, I mean, when, once you own something, you also want to protect it, and that's no different in the real world or the digital world. So could we move to the last year to talk about what the whole topic of this is, is how securely build in the metaverse. So let's see if I could have you come and talk about Hex Trust and, and kind of the role that you play in the metaverse. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we take the uh, the metaverse from a uh, very different angle, right? So we, we're not really builders, but we're more uh, enablers. So obviously, there is a, uh, I would say, a broad market out there of yeah, people that, um, especially on the retail side, are comfortable connecting to different uh, decentralized applications and metaverses using their own uh, hardware wallet or self-custodial wallet. But there are also there's also a big market of more institutional investors uh, that want to follow more or less the same path patterns that they're used to in the traditional market. So in this case, what they do is usually, uh, I mean, if they had this option, they would probably go to a bank or a private bank to, to help them with the, with the custody, the safeguarding of these assets. Obviously, this is not available, at least as of today. They go to companies like us that provide a number of services, right? So um, if you want to interact with a platform uh, like uh, Sandbox, first of all, you would need to be able to uh, connect your custodial wallet that you hold with Xtrust uh, with the platform and we provide with this kind of connectivity uh, like uh, different types of uh, uh, con connecti connectivity methodologies. We can talk about that, but mainly um, MetaMask Institutional as well as Wallet Connect uh, to Prino. At the same time, if you want to uh, do something on the, on the sandbox, you would need to uh, purchase uh, the native tokens and uh, right that they would be used to uh, make, for example, purchases of land. So we can facilitate this kind of a transaction where uh, whereby the investor from their usual US dollars or local currency account would have to buy the, the token. And then there's the whole kind of transactional part where the token has to be exchanged for a service or for an asset uh, interacting either directly with the decentralized application right, or with a kind of more or less OTC transaction. Yes, not all the not all the transaction in the metaverse, even though we're talking about blockchain, actually happen on happen directly with uh, via the interaction with the smart contract. But sometimes the purchase of a land right can be done over the counter, especially if it's a big piece of land, uh, or if there's a bilateral transaction from somebody else that is selling it uh, without want, wanting to put it on the uh, uh, on the marketplace. So we will facilitate that transaction. And lastly, and more importantly, we'll be in a, we'll be enabling the institutional investor to actually safe keep uh, the asset that has been purchased uh, within our platform and providing all the typical services that a financial institution offers, such as uh, reporting statements, etc. Um, this is what we do today. Right. I think yeah. uh, tomorrow there's a lot of additional opportunities that we can look at, uh, and that actually we've been uh, we've been working on um, already last year. Uh, then the market turned a little bit, so we put a little bit of a uh, 
we took a little bit more time to uh, to consider how to enter this market. But obviously, there are uh, all the lending so all, all the lending solutions, right? That traditionally financial institutions offer uh, against uh, real estate assets, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So mortgage mortgages uh, mortgages collateralized loans, but even things that can be uh, more on chain, such for example, to make the land available as a contract for building, or to one day to collect rent, or why not basically to provide some financial services to discount uh, rent receivables. Yeah. I was in fact going to ask you, if, if, to help us visualize it, can you tell us a little bit about some of the clients which hold land with you? Sure, I'm, I'm not sure if I can go really into the uh, into the specific names, right? But, yeah, but yes, sure. we, we do have we do have a number of institutional investors that, especially, I would say in in 2022, but also in the uh, in the past few months, they were uh, very interested in uh, purchasing and holding and holding land. So one of the largest uh, insurance company uh, globally actually uh, has purchased land and uh, holds it with us. We have some really large real estate developers, as you can imagine. <laughs> they probably yeah. they were probably the first ones to venture uh, to venture into the, into the space. We have some chains of uh, hotels that are trying mm-hmm. to kind of understand how their business model can be translated uh, onto a different platform uh, in in the metaverse, and yep. a number I would say of more um, general corporate clients and high net worth individuals that see this more on the corporate side as a kind of marketing uh, a marketing tool at the beginning. Right to uh, to kind of put, put their flag in a in new land, uh, and high net worth individuals or family offices that this as a kind of investment opportunity, as they would do yeah. with normal real estate. Got it. Um, speaking of corporates and, and institutions, um, Adrian, what can you tell us about the kind of interest that you've seen in in sandbox and the metaverse? You know, from your clients. Sure. So maybe maybe I'll start first with what we're doing for ourselves. And then I'll move on to uh, what we're doing for our clients. So as I said earlier, uh, we bought land on Sandbox back in uh, December 2021. Uh, and we were uh, trying to match uh, Sandbox Alpha Season 4 at the time. So uh, the, the theme of our build on the Sandbox uh, is called Built in Digital Assets. And on this Sandbox, we basically were educating players on what are the best practices of crypto world cost security. <laughs> Uh, and that would basically put the players in the shoe of a head of security, of cybersecurity, who would be tasked to recover stolen crypto funds. So there were also uh, educational quests for people to understand what they uh, think is important uh, elements in the metaverse. So that was uh, really educational in nature. Uh, another uh, another um, item for us was uh, um, hiring, right? So uh, we do think for our own purposes that there is a pretty uh, awesome uh, chance to uh, hire better using um, metaverse uh, technology. So uh, so that's something where we don't have uh, a, a product yet, but that's something we're working on. So that's the first part is how PwC itself is actually... Uh, leveraging technology of the sandbox to uh, uh, engage uh, our um, stakeholders uh, and also uh, show the the market that we are actually at the forefront of innovation. The second part yeah. is our cl- our clients, right? So as you, you mentioned, yes, we do have clients that are very eager to uh, get involved in the metaverse. Um, several of them are uh, conglomerates, some of which are Hong Kong-based. And they're, uh, what actually they're doing is creating a Web3 center of excellence. And, web- and Metaverse is uh, usually a core part of that center of excellence. Um, the, what we, where we help is uh, usually on, consul- on, on advising them on what are the various steps to take to build and also uh, to uh, f- flag what are the potential uh, uh, pitfalls, use challenges that they may not have thought of. For example, legal risks, for, for example, uh, cybersecurity and others. Basically, we would work uh, with Sandbox or others on the technology angle, but then we would also be providing some advice uh, that they uh, need yeah. for their compliance, for example. Mm-hmm. I think that's terrific, and I think that you know, trying it out yourselves uh, that surely must make uh, you better informed in terms of uh, explaining exactly. it to clients. You know, if it's it's something that you can actually speak credibly on, having used it for some of the internal things that you want to do at PwC, right? Exactly. And uh, we were also uh, we've actually also had held a, a metaverse challenge a few months ago, where we had uh, students uh, from Hong Kong create experiences in a hackathon manner on the sandbox. 
uh, and uh, we really saw a lot of interest there uh, mm-hmm. for uh, building on the sandbox. So, uh, yeah. so it's also uh, wow. just fostering education in Hong Kong. That's great, terrific. Now, I was going to say we're going to switch gears to Ina, but it's really not, is it? I mean, because everything about CSR, ESG, things that you're adding value back to society is part of business nowadays. So in the past, maybe not. It was seen as maybe work that people did sometimes on the side. But now I think more, bis- more and more businesses think that it's it's not a nice to have, but a must have. So Ina, I'm really curious about the heel uh, game and you know how that's going. And I think that was going to be an NFT that was going to be unveiled sometime this year. So the Hillverse is um, something that we had been discussing with Sebastian for for a while. The concept of how we can bring um, you know all these values in the metaverse, build it, woven it uh, inside of the game. And so for us, the idea was to educate people and to tell them more about what is happening on the planet and also this concept that is play to heal. So while they're playing and earning, it's also there is a healing action. There is climate action attached to it because uh, there is education and education is one of the most important things if you want to take action. And um, because knowing how you can participate in protecting the planet and also doing um having more sustainable practices. So we created the game with that in mind uh, with a great studio called Interactive uh, Metaverse. And then what did is that with each uh, level of the game, it was attached to an element of nature. And so we covered... Uh, water, oceans, water, scarcity, access, etc. Biodiversity, uh, genderity, and different, we wanted to put inside the game different uh, SDGs, but without it being boring, you know, because for yeah. a lot of people, yeah. it's like, oh, this is a lot. Uh, impact can become boring, but we believe that there are great ways to uh, have impact and to, to have a mission and and people in a different way. So the sandbox for us is a perfect way of doing that because playing is really something that people enjoy to do. And while they're doing that, really getting to know more. And we had a lot of players coming back to us saying, oh, I didn't know about this. And it was interesting to see that uh, I can have an impact on this myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so it, it's for us, it's a way of changing things. I've been working with the um, uh, United Nations for a very long time. Uh, mm-hmm. In the beginning, it was only around women and, and girls' rights. And uh, because I, I had been, since I was 19 years old, an activist and advocate for women and girls' rights. And then I realized that climate is one of the biggest threats against uh, women and girls huh. and because they are the most vulnerable in every situation and climate is an added burden. And so I started being an activist uh, for climate justice and a campaigner uh, with the United Nations to also change policies and, and everything. So there are different layers, but playing and educating while healing is something that we strongly believe in. And uh, we, we're very excited because thanks to the Healverse, based on what we did on, on the sandbox with the Healverse, we just did a, um, a, a partnership with the Open Campus and Animoca Brands and Tiny Tap to create a course uh, for younger yep. children and uh, to uh, use the characters that are in the Healverse, the healers, as um, um, characters in a course in the Tiny uh, Tap app to educate children about climate action, land degradation. And uh, I think that at a very young age, it's interesting for them to understand what uh, uh, our planet is about and how Mm -hmm. uh, they can, they at their own level, uh, knowledge is everything. Because uh, I think we're in a a pretty big race against, uh, uh, you know, global warming. Recently, uh, the the head of the United Nations said that we entered an era of global boiling. And so we at Code Mm. Green, what we're trying to do is really create a bridge between, you know, um, the the blockchain, the metaverse, Web3, and uh, communities either living on the front line of climate change or a global stage of people who... uh, I don't know where to start, but would like to have impact. So it's um, mm-hmm. these, uh, you know, on internet, but in real life as well. So every time that we can do that connection, we feel like we mm-hmm. have achieved something. So we yeah. it, 
it's a very exciting journey. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. And, and you're reaching people at a very young age. And I think that's terrific to start already embedding that uh, and changing mindsets and shaping mindsets uh, at, the, at the beginning. Um, to go now to Karen, because I'm very curious about um, the uh, culture aspect. Uh, Indian culture, India, if I'm not mistaken, is now the world's most populous nation. It's it's overtaken China. So there's a lot of culture uh, and that you're sharing uh, via the metaverse, and it's, it's a very interesting concept. Yeah, thanks, Christina. You're absolutely right. India is uh, the world's most populated country. But to share some more interesting numbers related to all of us, India has 700 million internet users, um, 100 million crypto unique wallets, and uh, a 350 million gaming population. So uh, that's a large amount of gamers. Out of 350, 300 million are mobile gaming uh, gamers and 50 million PC gaming population. Uh, That's the split there. But this itself provides a, a, a unique opportunity uh, for the market at hand. And this is where we're interested in promoting and bringing blockchain and Web3 technology to India for blockchain gaming um, with the open metaverse being sandbox. Um, mm-hmm. we, it was the last couple of months that we, we've been establishing brand partnerships and we're helping brands not just get land in the metaverse, which is phase one, working closely with them. As you mentioned, Indian culture is unique. So we work closely with them to create with music companies, entertainment companies, movies, sports, um, uh, Indian mythology. Uh, which is Indian has more India has uh, more than hundred thousand dialects, uh, twenty nine thousand uh, twenty nine thousand languages, and we are wow. working closely with with large uh, mythology companies as well to create the mythology in the metaverse. Um, we, we we design experience. We are helping them to design their experiences, create after collections and NFT collections as they build their experience on the sandbox. And all yeah. through this, and through this entire time to ensure that the creators have uh, get uh, um, create experiences based on NFTs, which is truly digital ownership, which is possible for them. Um, in order to grow the creator community, we also believe that India can be a Web3 studio of the world. Um, it happened in the IT and the Web2 world, where India is the back office for IT services. Mm-hmm. That India can be a Web3 studio uh, to develop uh, metaverse experiences, not just for Indian projects, but global projects, and solve the supply problem which we face globally. We are working closely with Indian universities universities uh, based in the south of India and Kerala and now in Tamil Nadu to develop educational programs to train college uh, co- college and university students uh, in Metaverse. Um, just like Adrian mentioned, the Metaverse Challenge, that is something that we are going to be looking at doing in India as well over the next couple of months and getting okay. students and projects to submit ideas that they would like to build in India on the Metaverse. Clearly a lot to look out for in terms of really smart talent uh, out there. Um, and can't wait to see what else you come up with. As we saw, you know, culture is super powerful. And Korean culture, as you know, through its K-pop and all the other manifestations of it, has is now so widely known around the world. So I think um, I'm excited to see what happens with Indian culture as more and more um, versions of it come out across the world and, and people start adopting everything from music to the movies uh, to cuisine and everything else. It's, it's going to be amazing. So thank you for that. Since of the theme of this session is really talking about secure building in the metaverse, I would actually like to move to that question. And I'd like to start with Adrian to talk about how you're maybe building securely in the metaverse, maybe something from what you yourselves have learned, using it for, for some of the things that you want to do for yourselves at PwC, what best practices you might be following, uh, what advice you'd give, what challenge do we still face uh, in terms of having that, that security uh, of, of building and, and security in the metaverse? Sure. Uh, thanks for that. So I think first and foremost, it's really an in- internal um, compliance challenge where you have to convince major stakeholders who are not used to innovation to uh, to uh, basically green light new uh, new projects. So that's that's the first. Uh, second, uh, custodying. It's uh, it's very very key. Uh, obviously, that's where you have custodians like Hex Trust come in, uh, and and their uh, certifications, their uh, compliance, actually will be uh, the 
the the, the major um, uh, assets we will leverage, right? So uh, actually, the, the custody will will uh, will be uh, will be a major part uh, when you have to go through uh, internal uh, channels, and uh, and so uh, the fact that, for example, you have a hex trust that is a SOC one, SOC two uh, certified, that's uh, that's a huge uh, um, uh, upside and and something that resonates, I think, with with big corporate. The second part is the technology and uh, and moving at speed and being able to rely on on uh, on good technicians. So uh, that's uh, that's where you you basically want to be uh, you working with a, a responsive. Uh, 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 partner uh, and and with teams of uh, of devs uh, who actually know what they're doing because uh, when you're a big corporate like PwC uh, you're not the best at uh, at uh, building technology uh, that's uh, that's yeah. uh, uh, that's that's uh, the uh, the sad truth so uh, so those are I think two, two things that I'd like to uh, to highlight um, mm-hmm. and I'd like to provide uh, others uh, the chance to answer those, those as well. oh thank you Karan what do you think I mean you're, you're relatively new to this uh, but what would you think about that question about how do you build, ensure things that, you know, what you're doing in this is secure? Yeah, so I think that uh, it, it, to build in the metaverse, is like we, uh, to build on the, on, the, on the sandbox, we have the game maker, the walks the tool, and we build through the game maker. Uh, I think that uh, we, we partner with Hexplus as well, which is our wallet holder, which is our custodian and wallet holder for the, for the crypto yep. that we have. And we, uh, once once we sign up the partners, all the land tokens are given through the Ethereum blockchain, and we pass the top tokens to the landowner. Um, so this is how we're working at the moment. I'm curious, how how did that relationship come up? Because you you are using Hex Safe, yes, uh, in the sandbox. Right. Yeah, and what and you could also address what are the main benefits of using a licensed um, custodian. <laughs> So, so apart from Sandbox, we're using Hex. Bharatbox is using Hex Safe as well. Uh, Bharatbox, like I said, is an independent JV entity between uh, Brink and Sandbox. And we've domiciled the company in Dubai in, in, in the MCC. And we're working with Hex Safe independently. I think Sandbox also works independently with Hex Safe. But we are, we are working independently with Hex Safe as well. Thank you. And, you know, I want to bring you in if you have some thoughts on this question. I'm right here. Sorry, I got right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Go ahead. Hello. Did, did you have any thoughts about uh, building, you know, how do you build securely in the metaverse? How do you keep your assets in the metaverse secure? Did you did you have any, any additional thoughts on that? So for me, it's always uh, work in progress and a lot of learning and education because uh I mean, I don't come from a tech background. I, the security, like everybody, I've learned by asking others and um, really connecting with uh, with uh, people who <clears throat> like Ledger or different uh, entities. But I'm not an expert on uh, on on that matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks for that. But on our team, we have people <laughs> who, <laughs> who know much better than me. Not at all. I thought I'd just give you a chance to talk about it, but well, well, well put there. Um, I'm now going to say that I think so, for, for those of you, I think you knew that there, you were probably heard about a giveaway competition. And I'm going to tell you that the answer to the secret question is land, L-A-N-D, land. Surprise, surprise. So just so to, to repeat that, for, for, for those who are participating in the giveaway competition, the answer to the secret question is land. So let me move on. Uh, we don't see any hands raised at this point, but we do have some community questions that, that came in beforehand. Um, they're not really designated to the speakers, so I'll sort of throw it out there and, and see who, who of you want to tackle these questions. The first one comes from Web3 Journeyman. And this is the question. What sort of technological barriers are we currently facing that is stopping metaverse projects like the Sandbox from producing worlds with more 3D-like and detailed elements? So tell me if you want me to repeat that. That was quite a long question. The second part. Uh, I can't take oh, that. Oh, no, you're going to jump right in. Okay. That's- yeah, yeah, no problem. I think it's a, it's a good question uh, like to consider like why uh, the aesthetic representation that you give uh, into uh, like the metaverse is... Um, um, I think there's a lot of... 
cultural aspect, first of all, like to the use of uh, the, the graphics of some are called voxel. Voxel are like digital Legos. So by using this simplified representation, even before the technical consideration, I think it's much more like accessible to uh, everyone in the world at every age possible. Because like we are already familiar, like we are familiar with the cartoon culture, the comic culture, the manga culture. It's not because it looks simplified, cute like this, that it means it's meant for only kids or younger audiences. And Lego has, has built a whole empire uh, around the world to prove the opposite, to prove that simplification in design is actually not synonymous of like younger audiences or, or like uh, misrepresentation. It's a voluntary choice. It's more universal. It's more expressive. It's very accessible and simple for everyone to use. It runs much more, much better in terms of performance on the technological side. You need to have high-end uh, devices to run it, and uh, like it's already cultural. Like you see, Rockstar in the street, in advertising, in all the games. There's hundreds of millions of people who play Minecraft, Roblox, Legos around the world. So this reduces the barrier to entry because we are surrounded in our environment by that aesthetic. And it's quite important to say and. Uh, sometimes less means more, and less complex representation means more, uh, like yeah, empowerment, more uh, expression, and, and convey better the meaning, the message, and sometimes the emotion, uh, and as well, and more creativity because you overcome some uh, design barrier uh, that photorealistic require. Photorealistic, like many people think that the future should be very immersive, very photorealistic. <laughs> The cost to produce like a digital human that's photorealistic, movie-like, is in the hundred of millions of dollars. It requires people with decades of training is complex 3D software. So it's the highest barrier to entry uh, as possible. It's beautiful, but it's slow to run. It doesn't run on devices. It's costly to produce, so it doesn't work at scale. You cannot populate millions of worlds with the content. And ultimately, it's not a guarantee that it's going to be more fun necessarily. Actually, mm. it's also stri- uh, the right balance between things that are very simple versus fun, expression, uh, and more. And I-, I see that in gaming. We're in 2023. The most popular games, the one that drive billions of downloads, it's Cut the Rope. It's a 2D simple graphic cartoon game uh, that keeps keeping hyper casual. Like they, they are called hyper casual because they have been hyper simplified in the mechanics and, and aesthetic. And still they are the game that draw the more people in. The triple A, PS5 games. And that's also a way and a proof that the markets can get broader when you have things that are less uh, like complex aesthetically. Yep. And I think it's important also because I was thinking out loud when uh, uh, we had all the other uh, co-speakers on this panel. Education has been as well uh, is a strong topic that is linking several of the projects together. Like we talk about the workshop from PwC, we talk about education with universe, tiny tap and the open EDU initiative was mentioned. To reach out younger audiences, you also use like simplified graphics that uh, appeal to them, like make them focus on the essential, not on all the details that the the, the photorealism can bring. So being more basic, but being more educational and being able to explain things sort of at this phase rather than try to go for the the wow factor. A little bit of that. There's more to that, but uh, that's the way to, that's Mm. one takeaway, yes. No, thank you for that. Um, I have something for PwC next. It's from Dave and asking Adrian, what's the most common problem clients have when building in the metaverse and how do you help them solve it? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think that the main problem a big corporate has is um, basically crossing the chasm. There is this uh, published maybe a decade ago about how technology is adopted from uh, the end group of early adopters and how it moves on to uh, mass mass adoption. Um, We're seeing exactly that with with the metaverse. It's this uh, this bridge. And and I think for for them, there are two things I'd like to highlight. First, um, it's uh, brand and PR. A lot of those clients have a lot of reputational risk and therefore they uh, there is uh, in their view there is uh, there's a lot of downside 
in uh, in uh, in, uh, in making mistakes with the new technology, and in, in, including the metaverse, the AI, for example. But all, it, it's it's just technology in the, in, in general. Uh, and the, the upside is not clear until there is a lot of adoption, right? So uh, so uh, PR is I think is, is one uh, is one major uh, risk uh, they they want to um, uh, address. And and re- and the second and it's actually quite related to, to one is uh, is compliance. Uh, and and again uh, I've mentioned this before, but I'll, I will repeat custody and how custody is uh, understood internally by the by the, the chief uh, information officer by the chief compliance officer by by the entire c-suite basically how custody is is is, is uh is actually used uh and and potentially outsourced potentially uh potentially potentially insourced uh with uh keys uh with with uh, the uh with the, their own wallets uh in, in a corporate this is also this is a, the second major thing i would think so uh so uh, uh so yeah i want to dwell on, on this point of uh of custody being uh, in my view uh, a major uh, um major uh, um fa- factor that moves the needle yeah Thank you. And that actually it says really nicely into something for Alessio, uh, which is explaining, I guess, you know, I, I know you could go probably into a lot of detail, but in a simple way, well, we understand that the Hex Safe platform, we've heard it already mentioned, allows clients to connect with decentralized applications like the sandbox. Uh, in a simple way, Alessio, could you explain how that works? Yeah, sure. I mean, actually, um, building on, I was thinking a lot, I was thinking while Adrian was, was actually speaking. Um, the, the important thing is that I think until we will have to uh, speak about custody for these applications, we're probably not going to see really full adoption, right? So in, in the traditional world, very few people even know what actual custody is and whether even when you buy a stock and everything, where, where it is held and uh, and who's doing what with the actual certificate. So I think uh, we're, st- we're still at a uh, we're still in a situation where uh, the, the the infrastructure is there. So we have the custody infrastructure, but we're probably missing this kind of uh, uh, middleware uh, layer that that allows people to completely decouple from the uh, technological aspect. And whether you use Hextra, or you use Fireblocks or Ledger, it's still extremely uh, I would say extremely complex for the end user to actually uh, uh, be able to connect to a decentralized application, store assets and everything. So I think the day uh, we have solid uh, application in the middle, they're, they're able to leverage custody platforms or software solutions for custody and basically they will be exposed to the users and they will be able to so the users will be able to not see anything that has to do with keys with seats and everything that's probably that's why that's that's where we will see uh, people seeing the advantages of using blockchain platforms but not the uh, but not the disadvantages so, um, your, your question on how uh, how you, you use our, our platform is the process the metaverse I mean it's, it's really for anybody that, that for anybody that has any uh, experience in, in, in navigating uh, through uh, the apps, etc., it's quite easy, right? So you, you have a, a custodial account you can use. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with it, but there is uh, recently um, a new application uh, provided by Consensus and designed for institutions that is called MetaMask Institutional. It's basically, I would say, a pro version of MetaMask that exposes additional functions. And on top of that, it has the, the bigger bench that the private keys, instead of being stored uh, in the browser, Right, and I mean, we know how many people have been have their had their uh, MetaMask hacked in the yes. um, on a daily basis. So instead mm-hmm. of having the private keys in the in the browser, they're stored uh, with a custodian, and then the experience is kind of more or less the same. Instead of having the uh, the application going to the browser and sign the transaction uh, directly in the browser. Um, Risking to expose the uh, confidential information, I mean, prior keys information to potential hackers. Actually, the transaction is signed um, within a kind of institutional custodial um, uh, custodial infrastructure that allows you to create policies to make sure that certain transactions are filtered and checked twice, and make sure that, for example, you you can say, okay, I'm, I'm never going to sign transactions after midnight, right? So if somebody's trying to sign a uh-huh. to, to sell your land after midnight, probably 
it's not it's not you and the and the uh, the custodial the custodial infrastructure will be able to stop that transaction. Um, the same thing can be done with Wallet Connect. Uh, it's a very similar experience. We're trying to make it as streamlined as possible so that basically the uh, the experience that um, user retail user institutional investors have in uh, with, um, with the, the normal tools, MetaMask Ledger, uh, is not very different from what we would offer from directly from Extra. But obviously with an, uh, an added layer of security. Yeah, thank you. That, that was a very clear explanation, quite simple, and, and it took us right, right all the way through there. So I appreciate that, Alessio. Um, in the waning minutes here, for some of us, it is leading into our weekend, and for others, uh, the, sort of halfway through the day or in the mornings to let them go. Um, I'm just going to start wrapping up here, and I'm going to invite uh, our speakers to tell us what's coming next for your project or for your company. Um, you know, what was your biggest takeaway? We have one from today. And if you can just give us a, a little hint about what you might be working on that we should be looking out for uh, out there. If we could start with Inna, that'd be great. Thank you so much for having me today. And uh, for for us at Code Green, we are going to keep working on the Hillverse and the Sandbox and try to build other experiences that will always support social, gender, and climate justice and um, be part of the, the culture that we are creating in the blockchain and make sure that it's as inclusive and impactful as possible. And for myself, I am, uh, you know, I'm always trying to get as much education as possible. So I'll be heading to Hong Kong in September to uh, attend the Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology to uh, educate myself uh, on wow. artificial intelligence and see mm -hmm. how we could uh, create incorporate that in the work that we're doing as well so uh it's it's a very exciting journey and uh and impact have never been so so how do i say? i've always dreamed about impact being exciting for people and yeah. i think with the technology with art and the different tools that we are we have and we are creating right now i think mm -hmm. now is a very exciting moment for that so that's uh Agreed. that's what i'll be doing for in the upcoming months well we're excited for you to be to hong where we when we hope the weather will be nicer we are still broiling here in hong kong otherwise um and the next time we have more time we'll have you in us a song but Unfortunately, not this time. Um, if I could go to Karen next uh, for, for what's coming up next, what are you, what are you most excited about uh, in the next month? I think in the next month, we are, we're most excited to launch our first experience or event on the Sandbox with an Indian partner. Uh, the Indian partner is Hangama Music, which is the Spotify of India with a user base of 87, 87 million. Uh, we are uh, excited to launch that and look forward to having Indian music for the first time on the Sandbox. Oh, that will be amazing. Definitely the two. Thank you. Um, Adrian, what's on your horizon? Yeah. Oh, thank you. So I think really short term, we're finishing a study with uh, the HKMA research arm. So that's uh, the Monetary Authority of Hong Kong. And uh, that survey and research is on the metaverse. Uh, so uh, actually very topical, uh, this Twitter space. Uh, so, that, so that we will be uh, publishing a report in October, November. On the, on the topic, and so what's exciting about it is really think that the regulators are uh, are looking at it uh, uh, quite closely, and as and, and that makes sense, right? As said earlier, and as we all discussed, uh, there are some broader policy implications when it uh, when we uh, talk about the metaverse and uh, and its its future. So uh, I'm pretty excited about this. Sounds exciting, absolutely. Sebastian, you've got so many brands already in the sandbox, but uh, any any hints you want to give us about anyone coming in or something that you're looking forward to? There's plenty of things coming up. I think like, like one important takeaway is like we've launched self-publishing, meaning like landowners can open at any time their lands directly to their community, uh, engage them, and start like also. Uh, offer them various ways to uh, monetize and, and more. So it will start shifting uh, also the perception that people have about the metaverse. Of course, we, we have a good lineup of brands coming up, but UGC is going to start taking up uh, a larger, a much larger portion uh, until like 99% of the content that we're seeing uh, in the metaverse. And that's for the better, because then you will have this combination of like cultural uh, content that bridge with the physical world and bring like a character story content we are familiar with and new things to explore that like um, typically the 
the, the Kilverse experience or some of the projects that have been submitted by the students uh, during mm -hmm. this uh, the PWC workshop. Thing that you don't find on other platforms because we bring different type of creators, more diverse creators, people who don't who haven't been making games before, but sandbox for expression and for carrying out their causes and, and more. Um, so that's important. Then 2024 will also show um, the world sandbox coming to mobile, uh, which okay. I think will also wow. keep broadening the audience. Here. Yes. For sure. um, and then you know we're working on updating regularly all our um, creation tools like our game maker and uh, adding more like different gameplays, multiplayer rules, ways for people to connect each other, making friends, following them, etc. Which uh, will keep pushing those uh, social interaction that uh, also define the metaverse. Very cool. I mean, user generated stuff. That's what makes the community right. When when the user users are directly involved and contributing and, and active uh, sort of consumers. So that's great. Um, I'm going to let the host of this, uh, Hex Trust, Alessio, uh, take us away with the final words. I mean, we're, we're already out of time. Just, uh, just um, I mean, in terms of ourselves, so, you know, we, we are a uh, institutional player. So our clients are mainly, are mainly institutions, but we, we believe that the same type of security infrastructure that we're providing to the institutional clients should, should also be able to, uh, to retail users accessing these platforms. Uh, with that in mind, we, I mean, it's already public, but we, we've set up a, a basically a retail offering for um, mm -hmm. a retail offering for basically our custody platform. It's called Griffin, and we hope to be able to uh, to distribute it as much as possible uh, to users in the, in the metaverse to make sure that to, to facilitate that to make their experience easier, but at the same time also more secure than what they're currently experiencing with the available platforms in the market. Fabulous. That's a nice way to top it off there. Thank you very much, um, Karan, Ina, Adrian, Sebastian, Alessio. Great Thank discussion. Uh, great diversity in, in the metaverse. Exactly what we wanted to hear about. And for everyone who joined us, thank you very much for joining us uh, on this Friday. And we will be. This is recorded, so we'll be sharing the link as well. So look out for that. If you want to hear it again, or share it with your friends, all the people who are this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.